everybody to this Edge of Mind podcast, where I am exceedingly delighted to introduce you to really one of the most remarkable individuals that I've had the great honor of studying over the last couple of years, Bernardo Castro. And so, as usual, I will read an abbreviated biography of his really impressive background, and we're just going to jump into some, I think, really rich topics. So Bernardo Castro's work has been leading the modern renaissance of metaphysical idealism, the notion that reality is essentially mental. He has a PhD in philosophy, paren ontology, philosophy of mind, and another PhD in computer engineering, paren reconfigurable computing, artificial intelligence. As a scientist, Bernardo has worked for the European Organization for Nuclear Research, i.e. CERN, and the Phillips Research Laboratory. Bernardo's most recent book is The Idea of the World, and I will introduce a number of the books that I have devoured over the last couple of years. Um, but in short, um, Bernardo, this is an incredible honor for me to introduce you to my community, to welcome you to what we explore here. And I personally just can't wait to get into some really rich stuff with you. My pleasure to, to be here, uh, Andrew. I look forward to it. Yeah, so I wanted to just share just a tiny bit of, of the impact of your work um, on my life over the last year and a half or so since I was introduced to you and then send this into your court and have you elaborate on some of the extraordinary um, ideas, discoveries, insights that you had. And I think one of the challenges really is you cover so much material at such a depth that um, to me, when I went through it, it's like, oh my gosh, what, what do we really emphasize? And so I will, convey to you what I think is the most critical, um, impactful material that I've studied. But then I very much want to share, uh, to invite you, like what is your principal message? Um, what do you really want to try to convey? But, but briefly, I consider you a, a modern day kind of Nagarjuna. Um, Nagarjuna was one of the greatest of all the Indian philosophers, logicians, um, in the, especially in the world of Tibetan Buddhism. He's been a monumental force. In fact, as you probably know, a big influence on Carlo Rovelli when he was finally introduced into Gardner's work, he was kind of blown away because here was a Indian philosopher well over a thousand years ago, articulating views on reality that are highly resonant with the relational interpretation of quantum mechanics. Um, and so for me, it, it's you also represent in, in, in Buddhism and in my principal, Bernardo, my principal background, even though I consider myself a kind of an integralist, um, no one has a patent on truth. I'll take it wherever I can get it. I, I, I find myself most in allegiance with Buddhism and in particular, the Tibetan Buddhist approach. I think there's a number of reasons that it has not only tremendous explanatory power, but a, a vast array of skillful means that allows one to bring the map into the territory. And so for me, you represent the essence of what's called right view in Buddhism, the first and arguably most important of the eightfold factors leading to enlightenment. The right view, meaning in this case, the view of idealism. And so I want to talk, explore with you what that really means and why it's so important. And also you, you have done for me a kind of in a more playful way, a kind of a Marie Kondo of my life. You know, Marie Kondo, she's the great simplifier. Go into your closet, clean out all the stuff you don't need. And so you're, you're kind of a Marie Kondo of philosophy in that you cut to the quick. You, you reduce in a, in a magnificent kind of parsimonious way the, just the essence, the getting down to the quick. Um, and so this notion of um, reducing, simplifying everything, which to me, in almost an ironical, ironical fashion, also elevates everything. As we reduce everything to the basic principles of mentation, mind, to me, it's, it's also this reductionism doubles as a type of elevationism that it actually it elevates the reality into dimension that, um, and maybe we can go here in a, in a few minutes, that arguably is part of what the wisdom traditions refer to as sacred world, that if the world is in fact of the nature of mind, which in Buddhism, you know, they talk about chitta, heart mind, in Japanese, kokoro, heart mind spirit, then reducing everything to mind is not just this cold cerebral enterprise, it's, it's highly effective, it has actually profound soteriological value that I want to discuss with you. So I, I could riff for the longest period about the impact that you've had on me, but I want to send it your, into your court. And first of all, ask you as a, again, I haven't read all your books, but I've read most of them. As a hardcore scientist, 
how on earth did you get into this stuff? What, what, it, what was your daemon? What inspired you to explore the nature of mind and reality at this level? Well, you get confronted with it when you are you know, in the practice of science or in the practice of thinking analytically about what's going on, especially when you work on topics that are very close to philosophy, like artificial intelligence. You, you build a computer that is as intelligent as a, as a physicist in determining what data from your data acquisition system corresponds to new physics and what data you can throw away. When a computer is as good as a physicist to make a decision like that, you ask yourself, if it's this intelligent, what does it take to make it conscious? What does it take to make its intelligent data processing be accompanied by experience in the same way that the data processing in my brain seems to be accompanied by experience? So you, you, you become confronted with these big questions very early uh, in your life as a thoughtful scientist. Um, and then you have an option. It's a, it's a major sort of split in the road. Um, you can compartmentalize the questions that uh, are naturally raised and put them in a neat drawer and say, well, I don't need to address them right now. Uh, greater people than me probably are working on them. So put them in that little drawer. I will assume a working hypothesis, which is that mind is epiphenomenal or secondary or derivative of material arrangement. Even though that assumption leads me to impassable walls, uh, I will just stick to that assumption as a working hypothesis and I will go on doing science. That's one option. Uh, the other option is you say, well, I, I cannot maintain a narrative in terms of which to relate to nature, to the world, to other people, if it's becoming clearly obvious to me, very obvious to me, that it's an untenable narrative. I, 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 I can't cheat myself to that level. And in my case, this wasn't even an option. I just am constitutionally incapable of deceiving myself to that level. I can't let go of the bone of a fundamental question that doesn't have an answer. It stops me sleeping. Uh, uh, it stops me, uh, uh, how to say, interacting spontaneously with the world. Um, so very early on in my 20s, I was confronted with that. And uh, it took me several years to sort of take a few steps back until the, the point on the road right before I took a wrong turn. And I call it a wrong turn because it, it, it's, a, it's an alley with no exit. It, it takes you nowhere. You face a wall, like the hard problem of consciousness or, or the combination problem of panpsychism. So you trace your steps back until the last wrong turn and you figure out what your options are and you revise your hidden fundamental assumptions. And that's what I did. Um, and once things were sort of stable in my mind and I felt an intuitive kind of confidence that, uh, that, uh, that I was on the, on the right track, then I started writing about it. And it, it's not... The confidence that that you get at some point is not really conceptual confidence. Mm -hmm. It's it's a kind of a felt confidence that you that is not thought. It's not conceptual. It sort of sinks into mm -hmm. your very being and the way you sort of resonate with the world, and it comes in the form of a little voice in the back of your head saying, "This is this is it." And your intellect is going is going like, "Well, how can I be sure that this is it? There are there are dozens of other." hypothesis that I cannot discard. And how can I be sure? I mean, I'm just a monkey that has been thinking on this rock for, for 20 odd years. Uh, and my species has been thinking for, thinking for only 30,000 years. Yesterday, the blink of an eye ago, how can I be confident of anything? And you think you are right in maintaining your, your doubts. And then that little voice hears this. And at the end of this discourse, it says, yeah, yeah, but uh, I'm on the right track. <laughs> it's a sort of a yeah, a, a very perennial, uh, uh, quiet, but uh, firm voice. And it's something you just know. You just know. Um, and then I started writing about it. And it's really this 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 uh, suggests to me, Bernardo, right away. One of the really elegant things about your work that the Indic traditions refer to um, again as the three wisdom tools or the three prajnas, which is basically hearing, contemplating, meditating, or listen, contemplate, meditate. 
where fundamentally, it, it, in my languaging, this is a kind of a Gnostic pedagogy, where fundamentally there, there are different forms of epistemology, right? Different ways of knowing. And on one level, you're already suggesting this kind of hybrid, if that's the right term, approach to knowledge that on one level, yes, there's this intellectual bandwidth that would be at the level of hearing or contemplating. But then you also seem to intimate that there's a deeper visceral somatic intuitive understanding that somehow, if I might, don't let me put words in your mouth, but there's some type of um, interesting intuitive resonance that takes place when you're working with concepts that are so resonant with reality. In fact, I would argue that's the real art of contemplation, working, massaging, um, intellectual material that is so resonant with reality that, that it collapses into reality. And then you know that as a type of intuitive homecoming. It's just like you're seem to suggesting, it's like, this has to be true. But for, for people who may not be so familiar with your work, maybe give us, this is a long um, elevator ride, give us the elevator pitch. Um, and this is not easy to do because again, of the enormous scope and depth of what you write about, but you've been pinging a couple terms that some of my listeners may not be that familiar with. Um, hard problem, the combination problem. And then underlying the whole thing, of course, is this, this kind of uh, narrative of idealism. So maybe tell us a little about, give us your elevator pitch before we go into the deep end of the pool about what is the, the hard essence of your yeah. um, view and your work. Okay, um, there is obviously a world out there beyond my individual mind, beyond your individual mind, beyond individual personal minds. There's obviously a world out there. The mistake materialist makes, and therefore our culture makes, is to say not only is that world beyond our individual minds, that world is other than mind as a type of existence. And, and this is a sort of a, a, a second but arbitrary step that goes into the slipstream of the first statement, which is very reasonable and empirically driven. There is a world outside, and it doesn't matter whether I like it or not. The world does what it does. It doesn't seem to care about my fantasies, my wishes, my fears. So there is obviously a world beyond our individual minds. But it doesn't need to be beyond mind as a type of existence. Uh, we can easily conceive of mental stuff that's not ours. Uh, I, I grant to you that you have thoughts. I can't access them. They are objective from my point of view but they are thoughts, they are mental stuff, in essence, they are mental types, uh, a, a mental type of existence, so to say. Um, so by the same token, one could say there is nature out there, an objective natural world that presents itself to me on the screen of my perception as what we call matter, but in and of itself, outside its representation in my cognitive apparatus, that natural world is mental. It's not my mind, it's not your mind, but it's mental in and of itself. And what we call matter is just what those mental processes look like when measured and displayed on the screen of perception, which is our internal dashboard to navigate uh, the world. And if, it, if you do this, if this is how you approach what's going on, you will notice that many of the impossible problems, insoluble problems philosophy faces today just disappear. The hard problem disappears because the problem of the hard problem is trying to reduce qualities or mental stuff to pure abstract quantities or material stuff. If you don't have to make that reduction because the world is now mental, uh, uh, then the hard problem disappears. Now what you have is there are mental processes out there, objective from your point of view, uh, that interact with your own mental processes, your, your cognitive processes. And, and out of that interaction, the qualities of perception emerge. So what you have is mental stuff modulating other mental stuff. Mm -hmm. Your perception is mental. The world out there is mental. That mentality of the world modulates your perception, which is mental. There is no hard problem involved. You can apply trivial reductionism. You know, your thoughts influence your emotions all the time and the other way around. That one type of mental stuff, stuff impinges and changes causally uh, another type of mental stuff is trivial. It's happening in our own minds all the time. I'm just saying this happens beyond our individual minds. There is mental stuff out there that impinges on our perceptual apparatus and modulates the mental stuff we call the colors of the world we see, the, the melodies, the textures, the, the flavors, uh, and so on. So this, is, this to me is, is so 
blatantly obvious on one level. Perhaps that's why it's so difficult to see. It's, it's in a certain way, it's hiding in plain sight. This, this conclusion to me seems so utterly inevitable that it's axiomatic in my world. But it's not axiomatic in, in, in most of the world, especially in the academy and in the scientific community. So Bernardo, this is a really important question for me. Why such fierce, almost violent resistance to this view? Because it's so parsimonious, it's so in resonance with reality, it has so much explanatory power, it has so much sociological value and power. It, 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 it's the, the greatest description of mind and reality that I think one could ever derive. Why on God's good earth is there so much violent resistance to this view? Because people have become, due to our culture, they have become unable to understand the word mind as a category of, of existence, as opposed to something that is private to a living being. Um, every time most people hear the word mind, they immediately make this association with a living being. Something Mind is something that exists inside a living being. And, and, and they become unable to actually parse and understand what is being claimed. Because for them, the word mind means this individually circumscribed mm -hmm. cloud of something inside a living being's skull or something like that. So people don't even hear what the hypothesis is. Yeah. Uh, they, think, they think they heard it, but what they heard is their own inner and wrong interpretation of what is being said. They didn't hear what is actually being said. That's one reason. Another reason, Andrew, frankly, is trivially psychological. Yes. Um, our intellectual elite arguably has formed around the mid of the 19th century. Um, before that, it was the royal elite. Uh, the bourgeoisie you know, came you know, second, around mid 19th century. And the intellectual elites, as we understand them, to, them today, formed in the second half of the 19th century. Um, they are largely committed to a kind of real politic uh, mm -hmm. metaphysics, mm -hmm. which is they think that they are the elite, the only few people who are, who are strong enough to face the dreadful facts in the face <laughs> and acknowledge them. And, and that kind of psychology will instill a prejudice in one's mind, which is what is right is probably what is the worst possible news, like total mm -hmm. nihilism. Mm -hmm. So, and, and they, they, they are psychologically committed to that. And if you become um, a spokesperson for science, even though you're not quite a scientist because you're not practicing science, you're only talking about it. And there are several of these people in the world today, very famous. Um, you become invested in this position. So a threat to a materialist metaphysics becomes a threat to your ego, to your profession, Absolutely. to your self-image, uh, to what you think others' images uh, of you are. That's a second reason. And a third reason is something so glaringly obvious that we don't see anymore, which is materialism in the second half of the 19th century has taken off the table the greatest fear of mankind of humankind throughout our history which is the fear of what you will experience after you die mm -hmm. uh, in christian terms are you going to go to hell this one fear has driven human cultures and civilizations for thousands of years it has been used to control people uh, even in europe in the middle ages it has been used to control people the church would control people based on this fear um, and materialism has taken that off the table in one fell swoop. Mm. It says, it, you experience nothing after you're dead. All of your problems, all of your anxieties, the, your depression, all of your suffering is guaranteed 100% to come to an end in a point in a not too far future. And if you can't bear going even to that point, you can do something and, and get there immediately. You yeah. can kill yourself. <laughs> and then all of your problems, all of your suffering is over. That has had a psychological payoff that is, is difficult to overestimate, maybe impossible to overestimate. Yeah. The problem is it came attached to a huge price, mm -hmm. which is nihilism. It has taken meaning out of life. So it has taken our biggest anxiety off the table, but it has taken the meaning of life off the table as well.
Yeah. Uh, and we replaced that with Epicureanism and consumerism, uh, which are strategies that work into your 20s, maybe your 30s, but then they stop working for most thinking people. Um, and then, you know, you, you have the epidemic of depression that uh, we have today. Yeah, they're really, I would argue that they're really sophisticated forms of distraction therapy fundamentally, right? And so let me, let me throw this your direction, uh, Bernardo, because I think this is such an extraordinarily important point. Would it be fair to say, when, when I look at this issue, to me, it seems to be a developmental issue. And, and by that, what I mean is that ego, I look at ego as an arrested form of development. Also, another way to define it is as exclusive identification with form. And so when we look at an idealistic world, the echolocation is gone. We, we operate in the world through a type of psychic echolocation, constantly pinging off a seeming other, really in a way to what? Locate sense of self, because they co-emerge. You can't have self without other. And so in an idealistic world, there's nothing to, pre to press against. There's no place for personal identity. So I would argue at a deep fundamental level, there's a, there's a fear of death even here. In Buddhist language, the fear of inherent emptiness. And in fact, I would, I would say further that our, our literally secondary um, point here is our fear of death is actually an inauthentic secondary fear. The, the fundamental fear, it's basically a fear, oh, let, let's put this issue of non-existence as far away as we possibly can, what's farther away than death? Completely unfair to this phenomenon of death, which is neutral. So fundamentally, it's a secondary fear born of avoidance of the authentic fear that fundamentally we don't exist right here and now. We're fundamentally empty of inherent existence right here and now. And so to me, it seems like one fundamental reason is, is psychological. And this creates a tremendous uh, hornet's nest in terms of hierarchies, because then it, it tends to denote a type of dominator hierarchy. That if in fact we're saying this is a form of arrested development, then you introduce the notion of dominator hierarchies. But one way to solve that is replace that with what are called actualization hierarchies. That we can work with a hierarchical approach through an idealistic medium in order to really transcend not only matter, but transcend the self sense. So is that a fair thing? Does that land with you as well? That even underneath it all is this fundamental fear of our inherent non-existence that's, that's so powerful, the fear of the truth of emptiness, that we literally freeze the world into our, in our image. It's like a perverse King Midas effect. We're constantly transforming the world into our version of gold, which is what? Solid, lasting, and independent. The very characteristics of the ego structure itself. So to me, I think I wanna put an exclamation point on this because this is colossally important to me to bring blind spots, unconscious mechanisms that keep us hidden in the darkness of ignorance not realizing that when we're looking in fact for an irreducible particle out there, is that in fact psychologically driven? If I can't find something out there, what does that say about me in here? <laughs> oh, there's a lot to unpack here. This is rich territory. Let's go for a it. A lot of seeds. <laughs> this is so important to me. Let's go for it. Um, what underlies a lot of what you've just diagnosed in our culture are some extremely trivial and simple misunderstandings that for some bizarre reason have congealed and become robust in our culture. Um, for instance, when I, when I say that um, under analytic idealism, there is only one subject and we are just dissociated segments of that one subject and therefore death is something that happens in you, not to you. Um, People don't really grasp emotionally what this means. When I say, well, your individual self is coming to an end when you die, but not what you actually are. People think, well, that means that uh, when I die, I will become some kind of ocean consciousness, but that's not really me. I am just this little being here. Therefore, I actually will die. <laughs> and therefore... I will be annihilated. And then there is this terror of annihilation that you referred to. And what people don't grasp is that what they feel as them, as, as the I, is really, really that thing that cannot go anywhere. It has, where is it going to go? It, it, it is the, the, the foundation level of reality. Um, but they don't think that's them. And 
this is so bizarre to me how difficult it has become to get this message across. I think to some extent spirituality is responsible for it, for having sort of romanticized this notion of the true I, the true self, uh, making it something that you only understand if you are enlightened after 35 years of daily meditation. It, it, has, it has turned it into some abstract, distant thing that requires tremendous effort. Well, in fact, it should take a grand total of about five seconds uh, for you to really, really see this. Right. And I, I try to use a metaphor, like when you are dreaming, you are in a dissociated state, you are asleep, you are dissociated, and you think you are your dream avatar, and you don't identify with the rest of the dream, the people around, the streets, the cars, the buildings, the trees. You think you are the avatar, and everything else in the dream is not you. When you wake up, that the dissociation ends, and you realize that the whole thing was you. And your dream avatar is dead, is toast, is gone. But you don't go around mourning the death of your dream avatar because it's so obvious to you that, oh, no, I was just mistaken about my identity. Uh, I was what I am now, awake. I was the same I when I was dreaming. I just was a little confused while I was dreaming. I became dissociated from parts of myself. But nothing is lost, yet your dream avatar is gone. So, but even then, people don't grasp it. They think that it's not the I that survives death. They think it's some kind of ocean consciousness, and they think they are the ego. The, the ego is the following. The ego is a mental process required for you to know to which mouth to bring the fork. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the ego. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's it. You need to know to which mouth to bring the fork. <laughs> uh, otherwise, you, you die. So evolution has created a certain default mode mechanism in us that allows us to know, you know, uh, if, if the lion is coming 10 meters away, uh, uh, that's not the me. But if the li lion is coming right in front of me, then I am under risk or to which mouth to bring the fork. But we really take that narrative in our hearts to mean that we are that. It's just like we think we are the dream avatar. And even if somebody goes into their dream and tells you, you're dreaming, you're not this avatar. The avatar understands it intellectually, may even agree with it, but still feels that the moment that other guy wakes up, I'm dead. <laughs> it's not the other guy. <laughs> and it's so difficult to get this across. And, and to me, it's almost a miracle that it has become so difficult to get something that is so under your nose, so obvious, so in the open, so evident. How has it become difficult to see? I, I don't understand this. It's a, it's, a, it's a social psychological dynamics that I think in the future we will get grant enormous amounts of money for sociologists and psychologists to study and try to figure out how we came to this because it has come to define our entire society. Now, the entire self-help industry is based on this un unexamined premise that your life is about you, that your life is about your ego. <laughs> this is preposterous. We, we are parts of nature. There, there is a natural process unfolding here, and we are part of it. That's why it's about. It's not about, about the ego. It's not about us. And yet our whole society even most well-meaning people will tell you, you know, to live healthy, you have to understand that your life's about you and you have to make the best of it for you. And it's like, this is what leads to despair because it's a responsibility the ego cannot, cannot stand. It, it, it cannot live up to this responsibility. There are too many variables outside of the ego's control. And therefore, you, you're being set up for failure. Not on the short term. On the short term, you will succeed. Uh, and that's what keeps this wheel turning. But on the long term, you will fail. But you will remember you succeeded in the beginning. So you forever keep trying to go back to that. Well, it's impossible. The ego isn't even there. How can it take responsibility right. for you know, the grand total of your life? Um, if you really, if I really... I'll open a door in my mind and allow what I just told you to occupy my being, I, I almost go into despair. Mm. 
because how can a problem that is so trivial, so simple to solve, have become perhaps the reason we will destroy our own civilization? The reason why the, there is so much avoidable suffering. There is enough unavoidable suffering in the condition we call life. We don't need to add insult to injury. <laughs> uh, and that's what we do. We multiply it by two, by three, um, based on something so trivially and self-evidently wrong that people have come to truly believe. I almost despair if I really yeah. let this understanding occupy my being. So I compartmentalize it because it's not healthy. Um, anyway, I, I spoke a lot. I don't know whether I No, oh my gosh, Bernardo, there, again, there's so much here. It's just, it's just breathtaking. I'm, 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 re I'm reminded of a really hauntingly beautiful story of His Holiness Karmapa. Um, once went to the top of one of the high rises in, in Hong Kong. If you've been there, you know how the population density is unbelievable. And at first he looked across this vast array of humanity with a sense of childlike wonder and delight. And then he burst out crying. And one of his attendants eventually asked him, Holy Holiness, why, why the sadness? And, and he said, so many people here are so close to the truth, but we'll never see it. And it, it just brought him to tears. And, and as they say, and this is, I, I want to emphasize this Bernardo as well. In the Mahamudra tradition of Tibetan Buddhism, there's a, a kind of a tri, tripartite maxim where they say, it's so obvious you don't see it. It's so simple you don't believe it. It's so easy you don't trust it. And so this important thing that you pinged on, um, you're saying so much, I want to unpack just a few things, that it doesn't take 35, 40, 50 years. It doesn't take, um, in fact, on one level, the notion of path is antithetical to what we're after because it, it denotes going someplace other than where you are. So in the Hindu tradition, they talk about Anupaya, the path of no path. And so this is incredible. This is this now we talk about some of the cash value of this view. One is that, that I think is so brilliant that you intimated. It doesn't even take five seconds, Bernardo, as you know, it takes a moment of recognition. Yeah, you just drop the bullshit. That's all just, there is to just it. <laughs> cut, cut the bullshit. Yeah. And really, it, it, my, my language in stop rescheduling your appointment with reality. Why do you keep having to defer it? Why not simply remove the cataracts of confusion? Realize that what you're looking for is hiding in plain sight, always already forever in front of you. There's nothing but this under every condition. So really the very act, Trung Rinpoche once said, striving is the only obstacle. Actually trying to attain something that you actually have, the whole notion in this case of psycho-spiritual path, that impulse itself sets you off in the, in the wrong direction. So fundamentally what you're saying here without me putting words in your mouth, that the contemplative editions assert is one word summarizes the entirety of not only a, a complete spiritual path, but arguably then also a good death. Open, relax, that's it. You're simply already bathed in, in this, in this um, radiance of mind. And so one thing I wanted to come back to here that is so important, you're pinging out some really important terms. You briefly talked about dissociation, dissociative alters. This is such a contribution in your work. So talk to us, if you would, a little bit, um, Bernardo, about this absolute brilliance of working with dissociative identity disorder as an incredibly powerful, iterative display of what's happening phenomenologically in, in mind at large. Because when I first read that, I said, oh my gosh, this is one of the most articulate, succinct descriptions of what creates this thing called samsara, the world of convention, conventional conditions of existence that I've ever come across. So talk to us a little bit about that because I think it's an incredible contribution that kind of starts to tie in and wrap some of what we've already discussed. So analytic idealism solves or avoids a lot of problems by postulating that there is only one mind in nature. There is only one field of subjectivity. It's not a mind like yours. Yours is an evolved primate mind that took 4 billion years on the surface of this rock to develop the higher level mental functions that you have and I have. But mind stuff or subjectivity, pure subjectivity, there is only one field of it in the, in the whole of nature. If you postulate that there are fundamentally separate fields of subjectivity, you run into the so-called combination problem, mm -hmm. which is that there is no coherent way to conceive of how fundamentally separate fields of subjectivity could combine to form a seemingly unitary higher level field of subjectivity. So you avoid all kinds of difficult technical problems by seeing there is only one mind in the whole of nature. But then you face the following problem. 
if there is only one mind and I am it and you are it, how come I can't read your thoughts? How come I don't know what's happening in China? How come I don't know what's happening in the galaxy of Andromeda? It's only one mind, right? Now, it turns out that there is one empirically proven process in nature that does exactly this in one mind. The mind of a person suffering from severe forms of dissociation, which now goes, for the, goes under the name dissociative identity disorder, or DID, it used to be called multiple personality disorder. The mind of one person fragments into seemingly disjoint centers of awareness, each one of them with their own personality traits, set of memories, uh, inclinations, uh, predispositions, and perspective into the world. Um, and we have known this clinically for 200 years, um, but there is always there was always a doubt that people might be faking it, um, which was kind of a ludicrous given the number of people exhibiting the symptoms. But you, strictly speaking, you could still say people are faking it. But since the advent of neuroimaging at the turn of the century, we now know that no, this, this really happens. There are identifiable patterns of brain activity that correlate with actual dissociation in which actors cannot do by pretending to be dissociated to themselves. This study was done in the Netherlands. There was a study done in Germany in 2015, a woman with uh, um, different alters or alter personalities. Some of them claimed to be blind, even though the woman was sight capable. A neuroscientist had this brilliant idea to instrument her with an EEG cap and measure her brain activity in the visual cortex uh, while a blind alter was in executive control of the body. And lo and behold, there was no yeah. activity in the visual cortex. Exactly. And when the host personality would take control, executive control again, then normal activity would return to the visual cortex. In other words, the cessation not only exists, it's literally capable of making mm. you blind to yeah. what is right in front of your open working eyes right now let alone make you blind what's happening in the galaxy of, and of Andromeda and each, other, each other's thoughts. So the hypothesis is the following. We take this dissoci dissociative process, which we know empirically happens in nature, and we extrapolate that one level higher. So not only human minds can become dissociated, but the universal field of subjectivity can become dissociated as well. And in the same way that dissociative processes in human minds look like something under a brain scanner, there is an appearance, there is a, a, a defined appearance. Um, dissociation in the universal mind also looks like something. What does it look like? Biology, living beings, life. metabolism. Life is what dissociative processes in the mind of nature that underlying field of subjectivity look, look like when observed on the screen of our perception. This is what life is. It's the extrinsic appearance of intrinsic dissociation. And if Bernardo is a dissociated alter of the mind of nature, then from, from his inner life, Bernardo can't know what's happening in the galaxy of Andromeda or can't know your thoughts because there are dissociative boundaries in between that do exactly that. Um, and Bernardo's dissociated inner conscious life looks like this, what you're seeing right now, <laughs> Bernardo's body. That's what the body is. And the end of the body, death, is then the end of the dissociation, the mm -hmm. thing the body is an image of. So it's a reassociation um, to, to, to this one mind of nature. That's the hypothesis. And what some people have um, claimed uh, in, in the spirit of criticism was that the alters in the mind of a person with DID mm -hmm. don't see each other, can't shake hands, can't club each other over the head while you and I see one another and we can shake hands. So the, 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 the analogy breaks, right? No, it doesn't break because what you have to keep in mind is that for the mind of nature, there is no outside world. The mind of nature is the sum total of what there is. So to compare that with the human mind, you have to compare that to the endogenous inner life of the human mind. In other words, to that human mind's dreams or visions or schizophrenic hallucinations, whatever. You cannot insert an external world because there is no external world from the point of view of the universal mind. So let's look at the dreaming life of yeah. patients of DID. Can their alters see one another and shake hands within their dreams? And it turns out that research done, I think, by Deidre Barrett at Harvard, yeah. it, it's certainly Harvard research. Yeah. Um, one quarter of patients with DID report their dreams in such a way that 
uh, the therapist sees that uh, when different alters are in control, they are reporting the same dream. Different alters have partaken on the same dream and they see each other as different dream characters. And yes, they can club each other over the head <laughs> within the dreaming mind of a patient with DID. So if this is, quote, and this is just a metaphor, if, if reality is the dream of the natural mind, then yes, the alters of the natural mind can see each other within the dream, just like the alters of a patient with DID can see each other within the patient's dreaming life, at least for one quarter of them who could report that. So yeah, that's that's the hypothesis. It, it, Bernardo, it's astounding. And in fact, one, one small ish, um, challenge with what we're conveying here is the, the depth, the subtlety, the profundity of what we're discussing here is almost like in a program, what we would do now is pause contemplate just the enormity of this and work to metabolize and digest it. Because I mentioned earlier, this, this tripartite pedagogical approach, hearing, contemplating, meditating, really for me, archetypally, is ingest, digest, metabolize. And so in order to really get this incorporated into your body where you feel it, you change, you live it, you breathe it, it's not just up here. Yeah. This really takes some contemplation. So it, for the purposes of time, unfortunately, we can't allow the gestation, the digestion that we really need here. But I want to just pause for a second and say it's extraordinarily compelling. One thing here that that this I want to explore with you, Bernardo, and this is a tad bit selfish on my part because I'm writing a couple books on this topic. When I read, um, I think the first book I read of yours is uh, Why Materialism is Baloney. And I have to say, in, in my household, we, you are affectionately referred to as the baloney man. So... <laughs> This, this book is no baloney. And one of the things that is just so bloody brilliant in this book, um, again, metaphorically, and metaphor, is it not conveys such truth because of the, the artistry, the, almost the ambiguity. It's like it massages the mind into more subtle dimensions of knowing outside of classic analytic not, uh, logic knowing. But I wanna talk um, in, in relationship to dissociation you use this fantastic um, image of the whirlpool as the cover of your book. And I wanted to, to ask you, have you explored, because this language is not overt in your writing, but when, the minute I read this, I said, oh my gosh, he's, he's talking about contraction. And so I want to explore with you the phenomenology of what I am looking at now is the combustion cycle of samsara and the path itself, which is the alternating current, mixing metaphors, of contraction, and expansion, contraction and expansion. Because when I look deeply into my own experience, talk about uh, uh, talking about my own path as a, as a meditator, as a practitioner, and also the explanatory power inherent in what I'm going to say in terms of talking about why is it that we suffer so much? Is, is it um, how much traction for you does the following hold? That when we talk about dissociation, one language for me is this, this phenomenology of contraction. And I love this, Bernardo, because this is something I can feel. This is not just a cerebral cognitive event. I can feel myself contracting up until a certain point until I get to what's called, what I call the, the primordial contraction, which is fundamentally, we don't feel it because it's so constant. The primordial contraction is fundamentally, what does that feel like? It feels like me. It's the axiomatic self-sense, the fundamental whirlpool that creates the very ah ahamkara, the very construct of the self-sense. And so for me, and I want to see how this lands with you, when I look at my, in, my, in my own life, I operate through, in the world through this constant kind of pulsation. And this is something that's not inherent in the whirlpool metaphor. One metaphor alone just points a finger. So here's another finger. That not only in terms of the, the, the speed, there's tremendous amount of power to talking about the velocity of the spin and, and the correlative of self-sense born from that velocity. But one thing that the, the whirlpool image doesn't convey to me is more as a heartbeat of samsara is that when I look at my life, I notice is in order to cross the street, I have to be at least to some extent open. Otherwise I'm a catatonic. Otherwise I'm so contracted, I can't even move. And so when I look at my experience, Bernardo, I notice a kind of pulsation, a kind of a, a samsaric tachycardia, where I ping enough, I open just enough to operate in the world. And then at a lightning fast tempo, so fast, the image I give 
is that you derive meaning from what are inherently compression and rarefaction waves, but there's a simultaneous um, imputation of meaning to my voice. With that type of same velocity, I open just enough to make contact with reality, and then I reflexively in, uh, co implode, contract, to refer back to the self-sense, and in that very act of referring, create the self-sense. So it's not... It, um, Contraction in the sense of self-defense, um, even though I would argue that's the case, it's contraction in the sense of self-generation. So I want to pause for a second. How, how does this work or land with you? And have you thought about, um, does it work in your intellectual and also experiential field to talk about how we operate in the world through this kind of pulsation of openness, contraction, openness, contraction, and its relationship to the dissociative um, image and uh, the whirlpool. So I know I threw a lot of noodles on the wall here, but to me, this is really important because it has not only explanatory power, really to me, this can profoundly alter the way we relate to suffering because our suffering is in direct proportion to the reified nature of the contraction and its ubiquity, its omnipresence, how often we're constantly pinching ourselves and looking elsewhere for the prick. We're the prick, right? So anyway, I throw a lot of stuff out there. But I want to explore this with you somewhat selfishly because I'm, I'm actually exploring this and writing about this myself. So please. I think there is a, a basic level of contraction or dissociation that is just our natural inheritance. Look, the evolution of life is the story of how, how um, alters of the mind of nature have changed in order to maintain themselves. Um, as long as possible in a dissociated state. Mm. That's what evolution does. And we, we, we use different language to talk, to talk about it. We say the life, that uh, life on planet Earth evolved in order to favor traits that uh, are helpful to survival and reproduction, traits that uh, are, help, are helpful to fitness. Well, in a, I would say the same thing in another language. Alters um, have been evolving in such a way that alters that can maintain their dissociation for longer uh, are the ones that survive. Uh, alters that have the innate psychological disposition to maintain themselves dissociated, those are the alters that have survived, that have made it until now, four billion years later, since the beginning of life on this planet. So I think we shouldn't go and beat ourselves over the head um, because of that level of contraction, because that's what characterizes the human condition. Mm -hmm. um, we, we evolved to, to, to be psychologically invested into a basic level of contraction. Because if you don't, if you don't have that mental disposition to maintain that basic level of dissociation, you will not care about crossing the street on a red light because if a truck runs over you, so who cares? So we have evolved over 4 billion years to have that innate psychological disposition to maintain a basic level of contraction. The problem is that we make it a lot worse um, on, account, on the account of culture. Culture makes it a lot worse than it needs to be um, because it has separated us from the broader dynamics of nature. To put it in very, very simple terms, culture has led us to take ourselves away too bloody seriously. We take ourselves too seriously, way too seriously. Yeah. Now, even some of it is understandable because of our false accounts, false accounts that culture provide us with and that we believe without further examination. And one of them is the following. One of them is the culturally bound belief, which is very, very strong, that the end of your altar is the end of your world. Mm -hmm. Because you see, mm -hmm. you, you see uh, we are the carriers of reality as far as we are concerned. The whole universe is something that is carried on the reality of my mind. If my mind is not there, then my universe is not there anymore. So death has this psychological flavor induced by culture that 
death is not only the end of you, it's the end of your entire universe. It's the end of your entire reality. Yep. And something very deeply ingrained in our natural minds tells us unequivocally that this cannot be the case. It's absurd, it's impossible. And yet another part of our minds, ego-related, culture-bound, tells us, well, but obviously that is the case. And then you have this unbearable cognitive dissonance, which some people mistake for fear of oblivion. I don't think it is just fear of oblivion. It's a deeply ingrained cognitive dissonance. It, it, it's not that fear, oh my God, I don't want that to happen. It's the following, that cannot be. And guess what? Indeed, it cannot be. It's bullshit. <laughs> now, you, you, you're trying to marry irreconcilable things. You have a culture bound story that is absolutely and utterly nonsensical, but you are invested in it. You believe it. People have been telling that to you since you were two years old. Um, and there is something in you rooted in nature because we are part of nature that when you throw that little story on those roots, those roots say, say nonsense, of course not. And you, and, you, and you cannot reconcile these two parts of these two reactions. Of, of, of your mind. And, and I think that's just the cognitive dissonance that at least some people mistake for terror of oblivion. It's not terror, it's just cognitive dissonance. Yeah. It's something that cannot be. It cannot be not because you are afraid of it. It cannot be because it really cannot be. <laughs> it's like two plus two equals five. No, it's not, it cannot be. And, but if you believe it is, you will face a weird cognitive dissonance. The end of the ego is not the end of your world, which is the world. It cannot be. And you know it cannot be. And if you just accept that indeed it cannot be, culture is wrong today, just in exactly the same way that has been wrong all along. You know, we think that our ancestors were just silly. We patronize them. We think, oh, they were inferior, they were silly. So they came up with these silly stories like the earth is flat or Newton came up with this silly story that there is this invisible force acting at a distance that he called gravity. We know better today. We are not that silly. We know that what's really going on is that the fabric of space-time is bending and twisting. And we think that we finally got it wrong. Everybody else before us, over 12,000 years of human civilization, everybody else got it wrong, but we have gotten it right. No, we haven't. <laughs> You know, future generations will look back and we say, those guys were not just silly, they were crazy. I mean, this story of materialism is so illogical and empirically contradictory. How come they really believed it? I, I bet with you, there will be grants given for people to study in academia, how we could have bought so fully into such a desperate amount of bullshit uh, that is our metaphysics, mainstream metaphysics today. Uh, people will try to figure out how on earth this happened. <laughs> well, Bernardo, if we survive long enough to even get to that point. And so that's, that's the reason why it's not uh, laughable. Otherwise, it, it would just right. be hilarious. It's a, it's, it, it would be a, a divine comedy if it wasn't such a yeah. tragedy. And, and this, is, this begs immediately, uh, again, the cash value, as Williams James puts it, of, of what you're doing here. That, and I want to return to some of these. This has, this is not armchair philosophizing. Not only does it have exp a tremendous explanatory power, it, it, it actually has this salvation, this salvic vivic approach. You know, this, this can really help us get through this um, extraordinary blindness, myopia that's fundamentally destroying the world. But just a couple of things before I come back to that, that I think is so important that this, this thing called ego, first of all, it's not a thing, it's, it's a form of development. So I keep coming back to this developmental approach to things that, um, I, I mean, was it Hegel not based? Uh, Summarizing Hegel, could you simply say one way to work with this is what we're talking about is transcending but including the ego, that you still have it. You, all, you always have recourse. Like when I go from age 10 to age 11, I don't kill age 10. I transcend but include age 10. And so in a certain way, this view is also very important because as, as we work with transpersonal, transegoic explorations, you're not killing something. First of all, there's nothing to kill. It's just an illusion. You're simply transcending, but including going beyond. You always have recourse to act as the 10 year old if you want to, to communicate to others at that level. But the view from above is a little bit better. 
So the other thing here that, that is so important to me, um, Bernardo, again, in terms of cash value, you've, you've suggested this a number of times, but I want to get back to it more directly in relation to, to contraction, openness, and death. Because to me, one of the most dazzling aspects of your work, and I, I work a lot in, in thanatology and approaches to death and dying, because I see it not only as a very powerful way to, to work with suffering in the world, but also there's the fundamental narrative of the spiritual path. As I've come to understand it, it's just death in slow motion. Dying before you're dying, releasing the whirlpool, or releasing the contraction, dissolving it into the stream before you're forced to do so. So talk to us a, a little bit more about how this view, right view, is a total game changer when it comes to this thing called death. That if we can de-reify death, see it for what it really is, that if the, if the world is made of heart, mind, spirit, whatever term you want to append to the ineffable, then there's really, there's no place you can go that is not mind. There's no place you can go that is not heart, mind, spirit. And so talk to us a little bit more about the dissolution of the whirlpool back into the stream, the, the opening of the contraction into fundamental openness, and then perhaps our inability to relate to that degree of openness that therefore then um, as a reflex contracts us back into what form? I think death is the name we give for the end of the dissociative process, a reintegration of our mental inner life into a broader cognitive context that is always there, but cannot be accessed through direct introspection because we are dissociated. And the proof that we are dissociated is metabolism. <laughs> metabolism is what that dissociated process looks like. Um, so from that perspective, death is not the shrinking or the end of consciousness, it's precisely the opposite. It's an expansion of your field of awareness that becomes less dissociated and eventually perhaps not dissociated at all. It's a remembrance. Um, it's not a discovery, it's a remembrance. It's a remembrance of the state of mind where you were before you were born, which is the natural mind, the natural state of mind, the thing that's going on, the foundational level of nature. Um, the good news is that if your great anxiety, if your, if your great phobia is oblivion, if, if the fear of oblivion is, is what is bothering you, um, then, well, how can I put it more simply than to say you're worrying about nothing <laughs> because you will be there to witness the process happening. Um, you're not going to go anywhere. That's the good news for you if your fear is oblivion. If you are like me, that's the bad news. You're always there. There is nowhere you can go. And you will always be experiencing. And there are rooms in the palace of mind where experience doesn't feel good at all. Um, and that too is part of nature. And, and the fact of the matter is we don't know which rooms we are going to visit in the process of death or after death. We don't know. So if you are like me, you're more fearful. Um, I am more fearful now than I was when I was a materialist because for some reason I never bothered too much with oblivion. There was too strong a part of my mind, very deeply ingrained, that knew that it couldn't be. How could my death mean the end of the world? It can't possibly be. And, and, and I know conceptually it, it sounds illogical what I just said, but I'm not speaking conceptually now. I'm trying to find a hook in your experience, uh, not, on, not only yours, Andrew, but the audiences as well, to convey the, the taste of that feeling, the character of that feeling. Um, my fear is what is present today, which is which rooms am I going to visit in the palace of mine yeah. during that fantastic change in my state of consciousness yeah. that we call death. And if psychedelics provide a good model of death, which they do because psychedelics significantly reduce brain activity, they don't increase brain activity anywhere in the brain, they only reduce all psychedelics studied using all brain imaging <laughs> techniques we have today, the result is very consistent. Psychedelics are a model of death because death ends your brain metabolism 
psychedelics reduce it significantly, but then you can come back to tell the tale. And whoever has done deep high dose psychedelic trips know that there are some rooms in the palace of mind you don't wanna be. Um, and if you ask me, do I feel certain that when I die, I will experience that process mm. in a positive mm. way? I would say, no, I don't feel certain. Um, I have some training in ego dissolution. I don't bother with ego dissolution anymore. It's a very natural process to me. It's a natural process to everybody because when you fall asleep, your ego dissolves. Le allowing yourself to fall asleep at night, at night, that, that surrender of your ego to something non-egoic, that, that's, that's ego dissolution. We experience that every night. Um, but with psychedelics, you experience that more explicitly because you remain awake during the entire process. For many people, that's terror, pure terror, sheer terror, that process. For me, it was first time, but now I experience that as pleasure. What I find mm -hmm. terror is the re-entry, is the reconstitution yeah, yeah. of the ego. Yeah. I find it <sighs> devastatingly claustrophobic. It mm -hmm. takes me 48 hours yep. to be functional in the world again. Um, if I have had a deep psychedelic trip, I haven't done it in years, but if in the past, if I would have a deep psychedelic trip and return, that return process, I experienced that as nothing short of absolutely devastating. Uh, you're crushed. Uh, the, the, the feeling of claustrophobia is so overwhelming yep. Yep. that it's hard to breathe. Um, that's not going to happen when I die because there is no re-entry. <laughs> um, and the ego dissolution, I think I will ace that one, no problem. Mm -hmm. But even after your ego, ego is dissolved, if there are rooms in the palace of mind that are tough, you know, the psychedelic community has drawn some maps and there are some rooms we refer to. Well, I'm not part of that community really, but I know, you know, the, the language. And there is a room referred to as the meat grinder. And I'm not going to explain to you why it has that name. It has nothing to do with meat and it has nothing to do with grinding. It's something that is ineffable, way beyond words. But if I have to put, you, put words to it, those are the right words. They yeah. are wrong, but they are the least wrong words. And that gives you an, an idea of what it feels like to be in that room in the palace of mind. So yeah, that's the bad news. <laughs> For me, it's mostly bad news because I never really feared oblivion. I never believed oblivion in the core of my soul. So today I'm, I'm concerned enough to, to prep, uh, to yeah. psychologically prepare yeah. myself for that, that process. I mean, you shouldn't have your life driven by it, otherwise you forget to live. If you're preparing for death all the time, you forget to live. But I find it worthwhile now and then to sort of go through a little training exercise that doesn't necessarily involve drugs or psychedelics, right. they involve just deep introspection, not even techniques of meditation, just introspect, mm -hmm. take account of, of your own mind, of its dispositions, its nuances, its subtleties, its, its usual patterns of behavior, the way it reacts to certain things, because the meat grinder is not a bad place in and of itself it's bad because you react badly to it and it's the energy yes, of that reaction that leads that's to it. suffering I'm, uh, bernardo i'm so glad to hear that last part because um to me again not putting words in your mouth and again i don't want to be kind of facile and naive here but there's several things that really come into play around all this um see, i'll see if i can keep them in order one is that and we haven't talked about this but one is when we talk about mind at large, the transmental domains, the, the stream that's outside the whirlpool, um, I have heard the literature is replete with this. I've heard it from psychonauts. I've heard it from oneironauts. I've heard it from explorers of the mind and heart. And I'm sure you know this, is that the fundamental fabric, the matrix of reality, it, it has an affective component. It, it's, it's not neutral. It's, it's basically good. It's divine. It's, it's sacred. And so I'm wondering how that resonates with you academically and experientially, because again, using the notion of right view, if we, if we deeply understand first at the level of the map, and then by dipping our toes into the territory, that fundamentally the world is in essence, not just merely mental, but 
um, divine, caring, we could even use without getting too anthropomorphic, right? There's this quality of being the ultimate holding environment, being love, dare we say. And the mystics, the, they, they proclaim this radically, unequivocally, that when you fall into reality in deep meditation, when you fall into reality at the moment of death, you're fundamentally falling into unconditional love. And so to me, this resonates with my experience, but it doesn't seem to be resonating with part of what you're, you're talking about. So the first question would be, is this a facile, new age, naive projection that the world mind at large is in fact benevolent, caring, basically good, divine, as many Western traditions say? Second to this is the notion of unconscious versus conscious processes. Uh, I heard one great master say, this is a really interesting statement. I wonder how it lands with you. It's not safe to die as long as you still have an unconscious mind. Why? Because that's what comes into light at the moment of death. All the unconscious processes are brought into the light of consciousness. That's what makes it too much, too big. And then, of course, out of fear, what do we do? We contract when that is released. So two questions there, the kind of divinity of mind at large. And secondly, and I know you write about this in an extremely sophisticated way, arguing on one level, there's no such thing as the unconscious. So I, I know I'm throwing a couple of noodles on the wall here, but this is big stuff. This is important stuff. They can really help people, not only with the end of life, but with the end of ego, transcending the ego through spiritual practices. So I think we're getting a twofer when we talk about this sort of thing. Okay. Uh, let's start with the last point, the differentiation between consciousness and unconsciousness. Um, what depth psychology um, in the early 20th century called the unconscious was not the phenomenally unconscious, the absence of experience. It was the part of mind that you, you cannot explicitly introspect into. Mm -hmm. In other words, things that you are experiencing, but you don't know that you are experiencing. In modern terminology, in the terminology of your friend, uh, Jonathan Schooler, in a seminal paper he published in 2002, um, he differentiated these two things as consciousness in the phenomenal sense, pure experience, and metaconsciousness, which is metacognitive conscious activity. In, in other words, we not only things that you are experiencing, but you know you are experiencing and you can report to yourself, I am having this experience. And there is a fundamental distinction between the two. For instance, you are experiencing your breathing at all times. But only now that I'm bringing your attention to your breathing, do you become aware that you are experiencing your breathing or the blinking of your, your eyes? You're always experiencing your eyes blinking, but only when I bring your attention to it, does it come into the field of metacognition and you know that you are experiencing your eyes blinking. And so that, that's one differentiation. What, what depth psychology in, it, in, in its origins called the unconscious is not the phenomenally unconscious of modern philosophy. It is experience still, but experience that is either not metacognitive, in other words, things that are not re-represented cognitively, or experience that is dissociated from the reporting ego. The reporting ego cannot follow a chain of cognitive associations to reach that experience and report it to itself. So it's still being experienced by not the ego. Um, all of these things are phenomenally conscious. In other words, they are being experienced. Mm -hmm. So in that, in that sense, I would say that phenomenal consciousness is all that exists. There is nothing that is not phenomenally conscious in some segment of the universe. Um, but we may have experiences in us, in our individual minds, that we cannot report to ourselves because we are not metacognizant of them. Therefore, we don't know that we are experiencing them. So many people carry trauma, pain, regret, anger, that they are not metacognitively aware of. And yet they are experiencing the pain. They are experiencing the anger. But if you go to them and say, are you angry? They would say, no, no, I don't feel anger at all. <laughs> Nonsense. You are feeling angry, but your ego cannot access that anger metacognitively. You have a false account of your own experiences internally, or it's stuff that your ego is fully dissociated from. 
which happens in like childhood trauma, people can become completely dissociated from. It's not only something that they cannot introspect into because of the inability to re-represent those contents of experience, but it's something they are utterly dissociated from as a, as a, as a self-defense mechanism, an ego defense mechanism. So I agree with the spiritual teacher you referred to that if we could be fully associated with all the contents of mind, personal and transpersonal, and become metacognitively aware, or in other words, metaconscious of all the contents of mind, both personal and transpersonal, then there is absolutely not, nothing to fear at death because there is no new territory. You know the territory. No surprise is going to be sprung on your face. You're not suddenly going to face your repressed demons, your dissociated past, your regrets, your anger, your ghosts, your anxieties. No, 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 there is no surprise. You already integrated them all in the field of associated meta-consciousness. I would agree with that. But the question I would raise is, is this humanly possible to yeah. do? I think the mind has a depth that is inconceivable to the ego. And I think, I suspect, I may be wrong, I'm not arrogant enough to pronounce myself correct, but I suspect intuitively that a human being that thinks that they have become acquainted metacognitively yep. to every aspect of their minds, personal and transpersonal, I think they are fooling themselves. Mm -hmm. I think the pit of nature has a depth that is inconceivable to the monkey mind to you know can, to... can i can i say something all right right here sure. before, because there's again that one of the challenges for me is you're saying so much that is so rich i could interrupt you at the end of every sentence but i'm trying to be a good patient host how your understanding of buddhahood enlightenment how does that fit in here? Because on one level, again, we're circumambulating so many incredible topics, right? When we talk about idealism, for instance, or is that synonymous with enlightenment? Is it synonymous with non-duality? Is it synonymous with Buddhahood? And so one thing that comes to mind with me here, Bernardo, let me see how this lands with you, is a very provocative definition of meditation in the Tibetan language, uh, G-O-M, G-O-M, which uh, translated fundamentally to become familiar with. So meditation is actually the process of familiarization with two fundamental things. First, the via negativa, becoming familiar with who you are not. I am not this self-sense. I am not this ego. I'm not my form. I'm not my body. I'm not my thoughts. Anything that I can append the label mine can't be me. It's something I possess or mostly possess. It's me. So we become familiar with that, disidentify, um, differentiate, not dissociate, differentiate from that kind of back into the truth. And then the second part of the path, that's, you could say that's one half of the path, dying to the false sense of identity. The second half of the path is same, becoming familiar now with who you really are. And that's the big question. Like what is that fundamental irreducible heart, mind space that is truly you? That fundamental complete familiarity is Buddhahood. And so I would cautiously argue, and again, this is something to throw into your court. Is this one way to actually talk about Buddhahood? Just this, this full incorporation, full familiarity with every spectrum of mind at large and you know, kind of the, the release of the individual self-sense. So you develop this true level of omniscience. Is that pipe dreaming? Is that hypothetical? How does that um, relate again academically and to whatever extent experientially with your understanding of full awakening, Buddhahood, enlightenment? Well, I don't know what Buddhahood is because I'm not there. I, I, I don't know what enlightenment is because I'm, I'm not enlightened. Um, I, I have suspicious, suspicions and prejudices. Uh, would that do? <laughs> Good enough for me, far away. I, your, your suspicions, prejudices, and conjectures are extraordinarily provocative to me. So conjecture I think, away. I think there is something that is completely realistic and factual, which may go under the name of enlightenment sometimes. Mm -hmm. But it's rather trivial, which is drop the bullshit. <laughs> it's, yeah. It, yeah. it's not difficult. It, it's, you may make it difficult by some incredible acrobatics of mind, 
but it's not. It's, it's, it's right under your nose, it's right there. Um, so if that goes under the name of enlightenment, then, then yeah, that mm -hmm. happens. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that entails or implies a complete metacognitive acquaintance with the depths of mind. That's, mm -hmm. that's a whole different ballgame. Um, now, if what is meant by enlightenment is a complete acquaintance, metacognitive acquaintance with all the contents of mind, personal and transpersonal, then I suspect it's a fairy tale. I suspect it's not possible while and, we and, are in... And why would that be? Because I think metabolism is the image of a dissociative process. So for as long as you are alive, by empirical observation, you are dissociated from much of what's going on. And to become reassociated with that, is it possible? Yes, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the image of that becoming reassociated with that would, would be your metabolism ceases and you're dead. Yeah, because it's and too you're much. not coming back to tell the tale. <laughs> so uh, I suspect that if enlightenment is taken to be this full metacognitive acquaintance with mm -hmm. the, the full depth of mind at a universal level, I don't think it is possible for as long as we are in, in this dissociated state that we call life. That's very interesting because in, in the traditions, again, I speak a little bit more with conviction in the Buddhist tradition, perhaps this is what they're suggesting when they talk about the difference between nirvana and parinirvana. That nirvana is to whatever degree one can reassociate, open, remember, reunite, while still maintaining this. And interestingly enough, um, Bernardo, not going up in a rainbow body, not going up literally, you may not know about the phenomenology of rainbow body that uh, masters who work with these sort of things at the moment of death, they don't leave a body behind. They actually dissolve into the matrix of life from which they arise. But this is perhaps the difference between Nirvana and Pari Nirvana that what we're talking about, again, somewhat hypothetically, this complete association, Pari Nirvana that happens at the moment of death, when the metab metabolic processes that we know associated with the body completely dissipate. And then literally one becomes one with the entire cosmos at large. So again, I don't want to get too hypothetical here. I don't want this to become too abstract, but I don't think this is fundamentally abstract in terms of creating the proper view again for what the spiritual path may entail and what, you know, I would say in a certain sense, what is forced upon us, a kind of a forced opening, a forced relaxation, right? At the moment of death, this forced opening, right? Uh, Andrew, I think there is so much that can be achieved that is that that would be enormously significant change our lives change our world change our civilization without needing to be metacognitive of everything that's going on in the fabric of mind uh, we underestimate what sounds trivial for instance mm. if you could reconnect with your child self truly that would alone change so much of your life that would make things so much richer, more colorful, more natural, more fluid and easy and uncontracted if we could only reconnect with our child selves. Because you know, if you imagine life as a car, that car is losing so many pieces along the way on the sides of the road. So th there is a, an enormous tray of parts that have been dropped and abandoned. And by the time you are 40, you, you're basically skating on a ball bearing. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> how much of the car is left. That's how much you, you've lost yourself, your natural self, for the sake of your adaptive self. Um, because that's what you learn from the culture, you need to adapt to the circumstances of the world. So you lose yourself in that process in order to be well adapted to the challenges of life, which of course, th all those strategies are maladaptive in the second half of life. They are adaptive only in the first half of life. So if, if we could only drive back, pick up the parts and reassemble the car, mm. and we are talking only about your individual mind, we are not talking about the mind of nature and you know, Buddhahood and Nirvana, that alone would have such a massive change in your state of being. Um, to be your natural self requires 
so much less effort and pain than to maintain your adaptive self in place. And your life becomes so much more colorful and deep and rich because suddenly it, 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 you see nuance and subtlety again. All that stuff that you've become completely blind to mm. because of the cataract of your adaptive self, that alone would change you and, and by concept and in, in, in turn would change the world. That, that one thing alone would change the world to just be your full natural self. That's all. That's it. Yeah, you know, yeah. you're looking for nirvana to, to stop yeah. your suffering. Well, you can yeah. stop 75% yeah. of your suffering just by, re by being your natural self, because your natural self knows that your life is not about you. Your natural self flows with the flow of nature, spontaneously with the flow of nature, with the flow of instinct. It goes where nature wants it to go because it recognizes itself as a part of nature and not a thing in itself, apart from the rest. Uh, your life would flow. You would fulfill your true natural purpose instinctively, yeah. automatically, spontaneously, yeah. without yeah. effort, without having to figure out where you want to be yeah. in five years. And all that nonsense, you know, all of that would just drop. Um, you wouldn't take yourself that seriously. You'd take life seriously, but not yourself because your natural self knows it, it's yeah. not a thing. Yeah, you don't, you, you don't take yourself seriously because you don't take yourself at all, right? That's a fundamental That's, mis fundamental yeah. mistake. And honestly, wouldn't it? I love this, Bernardo, because really, to me, what it suggests is to be fully human. Maybe that is to be Buddha. Maybe well, that's it. Well, um, I, I wouldn't go as far as to say that uh, to, to not take yourself seriously. Just don't take to, yourself literally. Is, is to think that there is no individual. So, well, there is no individual self as a thing. But the individual self is a tool. I mean, if you don't know to which fork, to which mouth to bring the fork, you're not going to be around. And therefore, nature will not be able to do through you what it wants to do through you. You, you see? Totally. The narrative totally. of the individual self is useful. Yep. The problem is when we edify it, yep. when we take it to be something it's not. Um, and reify it. There is a usefulness, usefulness in the rhythms of nature for the recognition of an individual mind, because that individual mind, for it to continue to exist, it needs a roof over its head, it needs food on the table, it needs to preserve a minimum degree of safety, mm -hmm. and needs to have a minimal number of resources with which to express itself in the world. And the ego is, is like the maintenance guy. Yeah. It's, it's the thing that maintains the tool, so nature can use the tool. Yeah. So it, it's not nothing. It's not something for you to get rid of. You, you will be serving no one. You wouldn't be served nature, nature by doing that. But keep in mind, the ego is there for maintenance purposes alone. It's not there to tell how to use the tool or for what purpose to use the tool. And your natural self, your child self, knows that instinctively, not metacognitively. It doesn't know that it knows it, but it acts in the spontaneous knowledge of it. And, and then you just you skate through life easily. Yes, and exactly. you will still suffer because when you lose a loved one, it's natural to suffer. Um, um, when you do something you regret, it's natural to suffer. But you're not going to add insult to injury mm -hmm. by wrapping psychological suffering on top of that. Uh, you will just suffer the natural suffering entailed in, by this condition. So that's one thing I want to say, the, wanted to say. The other thing I wanted to mention, I'm not giving answers to your questions. No, yeah, Andrew, I'm just, sorry about all, that. No, no, I'm just commenting beautiful. on it. I love it. The, the other thing I, I would be cautious is, how do I say this in a way that doesn't sound preposterous? We shouldn't underestimate what it means to become metacognitively aware of even the first layer of the transpersonal. Mm. Um, I, I, use a, an ex I came up with an expression for that inspired by Milan Kundera. It's, uh, it's a feeling I describe as the, the vertigo of eternity. I was just going to say that, exactly. I just reread that this morning. What a fantastic, please elaborate, beautiful. 
I, I, how can I even elaborate on that? We don't have language for that. We don't have shared experiences to build a dictionary with anchored meanings that it, it, it's terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying. It's something you will instinctively and automatically recoil from. Mm -hmm. Because if you're fear of heights, imagine infinite height. If, if you're fearful of heights, imagine infinite height. It's, and at the same time, and that's why it's a vertigo, and Milan Kundera, he said, vertigo is not only the fear of falling, vertigo is the desire to fall. And, it, and if you have vertigo, you know what that means. Vertigo is when you feel the pull of the depth. It pulls you down. It, it makes you want to jump. And you don't want to jump, but it makes your body want to jump. And you, I, I feel it in my crotch pull down it's like a part of you is right there ready to jump and it mm -hmm. will jump and that's what causes the fear right uh, and that's milan Kundera's description of vertigo so the vertigo of eternity is the terror of eternity of yeah. the infinite allied with the the pull of that it pulls you in it wants you to go in but, but and, this is, this is, uh, don't let me interrupt you, but I am going to. <laughs> this is so profound. There's so much here. But Bernardo, isn't it the case that, and again, this is something that I, I, work, I work with in my experience. When, when I feel the vertigo, the, it, it's like, a, oh, there's so much to say here. Trungpa Rinpoche said it so beautifully once. The bad news is you're falling through space without a parachute. <laughs> the good news is there is no ground. So it's only if there's a sense of referentiality born of the residue of the contractive self-sense, I would argue that that is in fact what creates the vertigo. That is in fact what creates the terror and the fear. There's still a residue of reference. How does this relate to me? Well, it doesn't. And therefore that very contraction which generates that fear also generates the self, they're synonymous. And therefore, I would say that the reason there's still vertigo and fear is because there's still a residue of the self-sense, that when that experience is, is related to without reference, it's like they say in the Mahamudra tradition, when the mind is free of reference point contraction, this is Mahamudra, the awakened state. When one has become familiar with that, enlightenment, the unsurpassable, has been achieved. So does this resonate with you academically and doctrinally, experientially, that the, the vertigo, the fear, the terror is still revelatory, that there's a self-sense still there. It's someone who could still have that fear and vertigo. The dissolution, in fact, is then not complete. It is possible. Uh, again, I'm not an enlightened person, so I'm not an authority to, to talk about these things. Um, I'm talking about the experiences I have had, and, and if they are the the preludes to what people refer to as enlightenment, then what I would have to share is the following. Okay. Beware of what you want. <laughs> Beware of what you're wishing. Uh, we because yeah. the, the, contrary to what it may seem like when you hear all these romantic words about, you know, all the love and unconditional love and all that. Well, at least in the first steps on that road, it, it may feel <laughs> very different. And, and which brings me to the to one of the topics you 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 yeah. asked me about and I didn't answer, which is evil. 